morning we continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount. The title of the message today is Prayer is an Invitation to Interact with God. Prayer is an Invitation to Interact with God. As we read our theme verse, in reality, our theme is about prayer. Right? The verse says, as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. My God will hear me. So, as we have been talking about the Sermon on the Mount, in your bulletin there's, a, there's an outline that I want to encourage you to uh, follow along if you would. In the introduction, I wrote, as some people may ask, from what we have learned from Matthew 6, 8, if God knows what we need before we ask for it, why do we need to ask him anything? Right? If God knows what we need before we ask, which is Matthew 6, 8 tells us, why do we need to ask for anything? And again, last week we talked about taking verses out of context, and I want to bring out this thing here as well, because some people have taken this particular verse out of context that says that God knows what we need before we ask. And what Jesus was trying to say in Matthew chapter 6, as he was teaching us about prayer, he wanted to compare and contrast two groups of people. The first group was uh, the group of people that want to show off in their prayers, They wanted to share long prayers, eloquent prayers, prayers that they would say outside so everyone could hear them, as opposed to a servant's prayer, where their heart is really what's connected with God, as opposed to the flowery words that they would use. So Jesus never said not to pray. He encourages us to pray, as a matter of fact, as we will see here in this particular text. As we spend time in... um, Matthew chapter 6, in the Lord's Prayer, remember we spent eight weeks looking at those few verses. Now we come to this place here in chapter 7, verse 7, where he says three things. He uses three verbs. He says, ask, seek, and knock. Now the beautiful thing about these three verbs, they are in the present imperative tense, which means two things. Number one is an imperative, meaning God is not suggesting that you ask or seek or knock. God is commanding us to ask, to seek, and to knock. In the present tense means it's a continual thing. So basically what Jesus is saying, keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. In other words, don't give up. So many of us have given up halfway through. We've gone through life, we've been praying for certain things, and we we reach a point and we say, you know, uh, God is just not going to answer this, and just give up. And as you will see today, there is something about not giving up, about persevering. So we need to keep in mind that God is asking us, commanding us, to keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. So, the first point is ask. Ask and it will be given to you. Somebody said the greatest tragedy in the Christian life is not an unanswered prayer as much as it is an unasked prayer. So many of us have given up on asking God because when when we've been asking, nothing's been happening and we've been given up and God is saying, you need to persevere. In other words, how how badly do you want this? Now, asking demonstrates dependence. And dependence on God is very, very key because if you've reached a place where you're no longer dependent on God, you've shown your spiritual immaturity. Spiritual maturity comes when you recognize that you need God, I need God every single day, every single moment, Because without him, I can't do anything. So in Exodus chapter 33, verse 15, 
The people of Israel have been promised that they were going to go to the promised land, and Moses is with God, and Moses is saying to God, God, if you're not going to go, so let me read the verse. It says, then he said to him, Exodus 33, 15, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. Moses has been saying to God, has been ch chatting with God in Exodus 33, and, and he's saying, God, if you really have found favor in me, if you really have called us by your name, how will the rest of the world know the difference between us and them? And, and Moses is saying, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us from here. In other words, when we come before God, we need to have this, this mindset and this heart. God, if this is not what you want for me, I do not want it. Because so often, we begin to ask God for certain things, and if God does not sort of act quickly enough, we make it happen ourselves. But we need to get to the place of, of knowing, without a shadow of a doubt, if God does not want something for you, don't seek after it. Because that means it, that's not what God wants. It's not going to be good for you. But we need to seek only what God wants for us. Matthew 6, 11 says, give us this day, in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. That sense of dependence, complete dependence upon God every single day. That has to be an attitude. That has to be something that happens on uh, every day when you wake up, recognizing you need God. Asking also fuels faith. So, one of the things that I said earlier, if you, if you uh, pay attention to the outline, it has a lot of stuff in there. And the reason I, I put these outlines together is because I think it's important for us to really not only hear, but also to go back and review. Because what you're going to hear today, you will forget pretty soon. But you, you have the outline, if you go back and review it, God will bring to your mind again some of the things that you have heard today. You know, it's better to have one piece of information that you act on right away than have a hundred good ideas in your mind that you never act upon. So many people want to get knowledge. They want to have a whole lot of stuff in their head, but they're not applying anything. And if you're not applying it, it's going to disappear. As I said before, what's the difference between a person who doesn't know how to read and a person who knows how to read but doesn't read. Right? There's no difference. So it's not about what you know. It's about what you're applying. And I want to encourage you, especially in this particular message that has to deal with prayer, which is our lifeline, that you go back and pay attention to what it's saying. So Matthew 21, 22. And the key here, everything's going to build up on each other. I'm going to try to take you through this process here in such a way that you realize that there are steps, not a formula necessarily, but there are steps uh, as we begin to think about prayer. Matthew 21, 22 says this, and all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. And all things that you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. That's the promise of God. And some of you have been saying, well, I'm asking a lot of stuff. I haven't received much yet. What's going on? Well, let's look at Mark eleven twenty four. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted to you. So there's a, step, there's a further step here. It's not just asking, but believing already that it's done. So when we look at this here, we need to say, God, thank you for doing this already. Some of us are waiting until it happens so we can thank you, thank him. But the Bible says here, believe that you have received it already. And therefore, once you have prayed, I think it's important for us to just continue to say, thank you, Lord, for answering that prayer. Thank you for answering that prayer, because you know that God is able to do it. Now, John 14, 14 goes a step further, says, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. 
Now, what does that mean? If you ask anything in my name, you know, some people want just, just want to sort of name drop, right? At the end of the prayer, drop the name of Jesus and everything's going to be okay. That's not what it's saying. In Jesus' name means according to his will. You don't want anything that God doesn't want for you. So therefore, if you ask anything in my name, according to his will, his purpose, he will do it. And then we'll go one step further in John 15, 7. John 15, 7 says, if you abide in me, which means if you have a relationship with me. You know, some people have been trying to pray without really having a relationship with God, and they're wondering why their prayers are not being answered. If you abide in me, that's one part. And then it goes on, and my words abide in you, which means I'm being obedient. It's not just about abiding in God, in Christ, but it's also his word abiding in us. That's part of the proposition here. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. You know why it's important to obey the word of God? In this relationship here, for, for prayer to work, then you need to be able to have the sense of you are abiding in Christ, you are obeying the word of God, and therefore something happens in your heart where you begin to pray for the things that God wants to bless. See, because if your heart is being changed and your mind is being changed, then what you ask will be different than when you're not in that relationship with God and when you're not being obedient. So it's very important for all of us to understand that there's got to be a relationship with God, we need to be obedient to the Word of God, and then we can expect God to do certain things. John 16, 24 says, Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. And again, some of you are saying, wait a second, I've been asking for a long time. But do you understand the, the process? You need to have the relationship. You need to have the obedience. You need to have your heart and mind transformed so that you're in tune with God. So what comes out of you, the desires of the spirit is different than the desires of the flesh. So what comes out of you becomes more in, in line with God, and therefore God will answer it so your joy may be made full. God's desire as our heavenly Father is that we are joyful. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That's God's joy. That's God's desire for us to live a full Christian life. And some of us are not experiencing that fullness of God. And I want to encourage you to really think about how you are processing your relationship, obedience, living your life. Is that matching with God? And then 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says this, this is the confidence which we have before him. Very important. The Apostle John says, this is the confidence. How confident are we that we can call upon God and he can hear us and he can answer us. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, that's his name, his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Twice it says over here, he hears us. And as we often uh, recite our theme verse, right, as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. And then we say, to hear is to answer. Over here, twice, it says God hears us. So that our request may be answered. And I want to encourage you again to really process the fact that if our lives... Are in right, if we are in right relationship with God in our lives, then we have access to God in prayer. We have this invitation to fellowship with God. Because what happens when our lives are, are not in line with God? What happens when we are living in sin? When we are living in sin, there's a tendency not for God to move away, but for us to move away from God. Right? Because God wants 
invites us. As a matter of fact, he says, you know, if you confess your sins, he will forgive you. But when we are in living a life of sin, oftentimes we walk away from God, and therefore we're not connected with him, and our prayer lives suffer. So ask, and it will be given to you. Secondly, seek, and you shall find. Seeking demonstrates desire. We seek or look for the things that we really want. Whatever it is that you really want, I can guarantee you, you will find a way to get it. Right? I'll give you an example. Your wife is in the dining room and you're in the kitchen. And your wife says, honey, can you get me that jar of mayonnaise? And you go and you open the fridge and you stare at the fridge after a few seconds, say, honey, where is that jar? And she says, it's on the top shelf right in front. It was, you know, facing you and you couldn't find it. Right? It was right there, right in front of you. That's not what you were looking for. That was what she was looking for. Right? But then, you, if you're probably like me, you like some sweets, and there's that chocolate pudding, you know, cup, that your wife knows that you like, but maybe not so good for you. So she's taken from the top shelf, she's put it in the third shelf, in the first shelf in the bottom, all the way in the back, and then you open the fridge, looking for it, you just scan the whole thing like a laser beam, bam! You find it. Why? Because that's exactly what you were looking for. It happens all the time in life. You will find what you're looking for. And so we come over here, seeking demonstrates desire. And in Deuteronomy chapter, 24, uh, chapter 4, verse 29, God is warning Moses and the people and says, you're going to go to this land. And the one thing I want you to be very careful is not to fall into the idolatry of that land. Because you only have one God and you serve only one God. It says, but if you fall into sin, Listen very carefully, because we are humans, and sometimes things are going to happen in our lives. He says, but from there you will seek the Lord, your God, and you will find him if you search him with all your heart and all your soul. God is saying to the people of Israel, even though I'm, I'm warning you about falling into sin, into idolatry, if you find yourself in that place, because I will always leave a remnant. He says it's going to destroy everybody, but it's going to leave a remnant. It says if you find yourself in that place, if you seek me from that place, you will find me if you search for me with all your heart and with all your soul. So even in sin, God says if you search for me, if your heart is really looking for me, you will find me. And so that gives us no excuse because, yeah, we're human beings. Yes, we're not perfect. Yes, we'll make mistakes. But God is saying, if you seek for me, you will find me. So are we willing to seek God even in that place? Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now, something very important here. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. But the, he adds something else, because some of us are trying to seek the Lord while we're still in our sin, unwilling to relinquish our sins. He says then, verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return. It's not about just coming to God with, with all my sins and keeping all my sins. It's coming to God so he can clean me up. And a lot of people say, you know, the church is a hospital for sinners, right? Which it is. But the fact of the matter is, once you go to the hospital, how many of you want to stay a real long time in the hospital? 
Nobody. You want to go get healed so you can go out there and do what you need to do. So we need to come to church, yes, that hospital for sinners. We need to be fixed, healed, so we can go out there and do the work that God has called us to do. And I think too many of us, I think too many of us are forgetting the fact that we need to sort of get to that place to forsake our ways and our un unrighteous thoughts in order for God to be able to use us the way he intended to use us. Seeking involves also innovation. Seeking involves innovation. We become very creative when we're looking for something. In Luke chapter 8, verse 43 and following, you have the story of the woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and nobody could heal her. And I want you to think about this very carefully because this, you know, the scripture is so interesting because you read stories after stories many, many times, and yet every so often God just opens your eyes just a little bit more so you can see something you never saw before. And I want you to see something here that I can guarantee you you had not saw it before. And a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him, meaning Jesus, and touched the fringe of his cloak. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, who is the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, listen very carefully, Master, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone did touch me, for I was aware that power had gone out of me. When the woman saw that she had no, uh, not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before him and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. A couple of things that I want you to think about in this passage here. Number one, think about the creativity. Who told this woman that if she just touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she would be healed. Who told, them, who told her that? Nobody. Nowhere in Scripture does it say, this is how you ought to pray. You want a healing. Touch Jesus' garment. It doesn't say that. But she was creative enough because her heart was so much seeking after God that she decided, I'm going to do this. Now, I want you to look at the second point. It says that when Jesus says, who touched me? Peter said, the crowd is pressing in on you. How, wh why would you say that? Everybody's pushing against you. And I want you to make a distinction between pressing on Jesus and pressing on Jesus with purpose. This woman had a particular purpose. Her heart was seeking God, and therefore when she touched Jesus, the rest of the people were touching Jesus. Nothing was happening to them. There was no healing taking place of all the other people. Why this one woman? Because this one woman had a heart seeking for God, and in, in her heart she knew if he could just touch the hem of his garment. And when she did that, she was healed because Jesus knew her heart. All the other people were touching him, but none of them were really seeking anything. She was seeking something in particular. And the last verse there, verse 48, it says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your faith has made you well. The innovation of this woman to think if I could just touch him. And I want you to think about this because I want you, I don't know where you're at and what you're looking for, what you're calling on God for, but can you sort of be with God and have such a heart for God that you can do it differently? Because prayer is not a formula, right? Prayer is not about, you know, how I'm going to go about this. Prayer is the heart because God sees the heart. That's all he sees. You can put all kinds of facade. God doesn't care. 
You can impress somebody else. God doesn't care, but God cares about your heart. What is it that is in your heart? And that's how he's going to begin to answer you. In Luke chapter 19, we have another example. As he's entering Jericho and passing through, verse, uh, Luke 19 verse 1, he entered into Jericho and passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because, the cro- because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up in a, tree, in a sycamore tree in order to see him. And he was about to pass through that way, because Jesus was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay with you at your house. I want you to think about this. Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector. Not a friend of Jesus in that sense. He's a sinner among sinners. He's a thief. But he has heard about this Jesus. And I think something's been stirring in his heart that what, he do, what he's doing is not right. So as he heard that Jesus is coming by, uh, passing by this road in Jericho, he decided, I've got to see this Jesus. Now again, think about his heart has begun to change before before this happened. But now he's hearing about Jesus is going to come through, and he decides, and and somebody said something that's interesting, because the crowd is preventing him from seeing Jesus, right? And so somebody said once, the Christians are often stopping the unbeliever from seeing Jesus. Let that sink in for a little bit, right? The Christians are are, are preventing the sinner from seeing Jesus. But Zacchaeus was very creative in his way. He wanted to see Jesus, so what is is he going to do? Remember, he's a rich man, right? Probably with some fancy clothes on. And he's going to climb a tree in order to see Jesus. What are you willing, what am I willing to do in order to see Jesus? Am I willing to do whatever it takes? Or should I just be kind of, you know, well, Jesus, if you want to do it, great. If you don't want to do it, you know, no big deal. Is that how you're praying? Is that the intensity of your heart? Nothing's going to happen if that is the case. Zacchaeus went and climbed up a tree. And then as Jesus was passing by, remember again, Jesus sees the heart. Jesus, as he came right where Zacchaeus was, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, come down. Today, I'm going to have supper with you. God knows your heart. And you need to make sure your heart is right, seeking after him. So our third point is, knock and it shall be open. In Luke chapter 18... We have, again, uh, another example here. Because knocking creates courage. When, you know, if you're, have anybody here a door-to-door salesman in the past? I was. Have you done cold calls? You go knocking on somebody's door because you want to sell them something? And your heart is beating like 10,000 miles a minute? But knocking creates courage. When you believe in what you have, it creates courage for you to do what you need to do. So, as we talk about, talk about this courage aspect of it, we, we have in Luke chapter 18, verse 35, it says, As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So there's a a lot of noise. He's blind. He can't see. But he's heard about Jesus. And so they tell him what Jesus is coming by. 
So he is trying to be courageous now. He's calling out. He's in a crowd. He's calling out. And look at what verse 39 says. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Have you ever been in a place where you're, you, know, you, you, are, you are coming before God and um, you're excited and the rest of the people are not so excited and you're sort of tempered by, you know, if, if I get a real big amen here, are they going to look at me funny? If I say praise the Lord here, are they going to look at me funny? And so sometimes we don't have the courage to just allow ourselves to express who we are. And I want to give you permission to express who you are. Because when God overwhelms you with his presence and and his power, then you do what God says for you to do. This man cried out all the more. And verse 40, what happened? Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. I'm illustrating this so that you can have a sense of, you know, how creative and how courageous are you going to be in your prayers as you address God? As God invites you to interact with Him in prayer, how creative are you going to be in that time of prayer? And what I want to say is the fact, again, that God sees the heart, and because He sees the heart, you need to prepare your heart. And one of the things that I think is going to be very important is the fact that you and I need to develop or create time to be with God. We can't have all these things from God on the run or on the go. See, we live in a society, again, that we're so busy that everything is on the go. And yet we see over and over again, it is those who stop, those who seek God, those who make space for God, those who make time for God, that are enjoying the presence and the blessings of God. So I want you to think about that. God has so much for his children. And yet, it's very sad that so many Christians are totally unhappy, totally unenergized for God because they feel that God is not hearing them, God is not answering them, while God is saying, I'm looking at your heart. What's in your heart? Knocking involves persistency. And this is another passage in Scripture where maybe... We have missed it before. And I want you to highlight this in your Bible when you get a chance. Isaiah 62, verse 6 and 7. It says, this is Jerusalem that's been broken down. It says, on your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. Listen to this now. All day. And all night, they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves. And give him, meaning God, no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. What this verse is saying here is this. That God had appointed watchmen to pray over the city. And he says, all day... And all night, they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, you who remind the Lord, the promises of God are here, and we need to come before God and say, God, remember what you said here? 
I want to remind you of what you said. And I'm not going to stop day or night. I'm going to keep persevering, asking you to do what you promised to do. All day and all night they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves. And give God no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. We have a responsibility. It's not a casual thing that we come before God and say, you know, God, this is what I really want. Or God, this is what needs to happen. And then we just go on. Where's the intensity? Where's the focus? Where's the heart that recognizes that God says he will answer and God says, depend on me. Don't depend on mankind. Don't depend on your resources. Depend on me for every single thing, every single day. Too often, we have lost this trait of being persistent. You know why? Because we have so much going on in our world that we are always distracted. We are always distracted. It doesn't matter where you go, you will see people not focused on each other, but completely distracted with all the technology that we have today, with all the stuff that's going on in the world, we get distracted. And this is reminding us to go back to God, not in a rush, creating space and time to be with God because he has so much to give us. And so as we conclude, God does not play favorites. Everyone who prays receives. Now I spent all, all this time in verse 7, but verses 8 through 11 really make the case. It says this, for everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? Verse 11 says, if you then being evil, that's us, if we know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? If we know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will God give to us? We need to learn to be askers and seekers and knockers that will never stop. Trusting that God is the one calling us to this here. And as we think about prayer, prayer is nothing more than ask. And I have a slide there that I hope comes up concerning prayer. Prayer is nothing more than ask. So the first letter there, it's really there. You can't see it, but it's there. Right? Ask. The second is what? Seek. The third is knock. What does that spell? Ask. God is, is saying to us, prayer is about asking. Every day, we need to be dependent on God, asking Him to help us in what we need to do in order to fulfill His plan uh, on this earth, to fulfill the plans of His kingdom on this earth. Romans 8.32 is one of the verses that I often go, go back to. It says this, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? And the point is this, if God gave us the most precious thing he had, his son Jesus, he gave, a, he gave his son to die for our sins, if he gave us his son, which is the most precious thing to him, why do you think he will withhold anything good for you and for me as his children? 
And the answer is absolutely nothing. He has no reason. He's able to do all things. Nothing is too difficult for him. So therefore, we need to come expectantly. We need to get to that place where we circle the things in our lives that we need in order to accomplish the purpose of God. And tirelessly, we need to come in prayer. Again, some of us come to church only on Sundays. But I want you to know, I hope you're reading your Bible throughout the week. I hope you're praying throughout the week. It's important for us to be able to come together. God has a plan. And He will reveal it to us. God is able to answer us. Nothing is too difficult for Him. So I want to invite you today to continually ask Him. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Don't give up. Because God is faithful to do what He wants to do in His time for His purpose. Amen? Let us bow our heads in prayer. As you process what you have heard, it's important for each one of us to recognize that maybe God has been stirring your heart for a little while. It's just like Zacchaeus. His heart was being stirred way before he went on that road to Jericho there and climbed that tree when he found out that Jesus was coming. Something was already happening in him. And maybe as you heard the message today, something has been happening in you throughout this week. And what's happening is that God is inviting you to become a child of God. As we've said before, we're all creations of God, but we become children of God when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so I want to ask, as you have your heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone here today willing to make a decision to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? If you're in that place where you want to accept Jesus Christ, if you would just raise your hand, I want to pray with you. Is there anyone ready to make that commitment? To accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. This is between you and God. I just want to pray with you. God knows your heart. If we are in a place where we've all accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then let me pray for us. Gracious God, once again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you open our eyes to see just incredible things. And Father, we thank you for this invitation of prayer to join you, to have fellowship with you, to recognize that you want us to have life and to have it more abundantly. Father, you know the hearts of each one of us here today. You know what we are crying out for. You know what we need. And as we continue to call unto you, to, to ask and to seek and to knock, give us the stamina not to give up, but to know that you are listening. And as you hear us, you will answer us. So Father, whatever is going on, in the lives of your children today. May you be glorified in answering our prayers. Teach us to circle them. Teach us to remind you of all that you have written, that we may believe that our hearts may be purified, convicted to know that if you said it, you will make it happen. And so teach us to watch expectantly for what you will do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.